Good afternoon. Okay, usually when I say good morning or good afternoon, it's a call and response, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just want to make sure everybody's refreshed after lunch. So we're going to move along in our program. I have the honor of introducing the Forget Tech What About Humans session, which is going to be facilitated by Dr. Marie. She's French. I can't pronounce the last name. P, but I'll home. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. It's wonderful to be here, and we know we got a tougher slot because it's after lunch, okay? So we decided to keep you awake for 45 minutes. The next session, you can uh, take a siest if you want. <laughs> but uh, I'm Marie Puibaro. Uh, I'm Global Head of Research at uh, JLL Corporate Solution, and I've got this wonderful panel uh, with me today. Uh, we have Kate uh, from the ANZ Banking Group uh, coming from uh, all the way from Australia. Uh, Peter uh, from EFM and coming all the way from Germany. Uh, Hala, uh, who say that she was a little confused about nationality, but she's English, uh, and uh, uh, um, and you feel also very uh, very French, but you are uh, Lebanese uh, from your origin, as you can see on your you know the way you look. So uh, from uh, uh, PLP uh, architecture, because yes, you do look very Lebanese, and Jaren, um, who come from uh, you know the Netherlands uh, and. Uh, works at uh, Edge uh, Technologies. Uh, you are the senior VP for Edge Technologies in America. Okay, So five nationalities on stage, and as you can see, three women and not one American on stage. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very proud. We're very proud to talk about this topic of Forget Tech. What about the human? So I'm going to set the scene. Okay, I'm going to tell you what we want to talk about and what I've, I've tasked uh, this wonderful panel to also uh, talk about. Clearly, the question is a big uh, you know, challenge, and we wanted to make sure that they addressed it at different level. So I'll do a quick inter introduction, and then I will invite each of them to give you a five-minute pitch on their point of view about the place of technology in real estate, and what about the humans, okay? <laughs> After that, we want questions from you. So I'm giving you a 25 minutes warning for you to start to think about your question and we will be running around with the mic and collecting this question, okay? So half of the session will be with you and engaging you. Okay, so forget tech, what about the humans? Um, the question was um, difficult to approach because uh, digital is touching everything we do into our life, professionally, but also privately. And in real estate, we've heard already that we've been completely shaken up uh, by um, you know, the world of uh, technology uh, invading you know, our life. It is overwhelming, uh, and we're not too sure if we are on the right path. I mean, certainly the presentation that Andrea gave us yesterday about the mass of technology entering our market is freaky. Okay, the conversation this morning about prop tech, the level of investment we need to look at is also quite freaky. Okay, so trying to make sense out of it is, uh, is uh, difficult. But there's one thing that we know, is that digital is no longer a differentiating advantage. Uh, it's now the price of admission. Okay, if you don't invest into digital and technology today in real estate, you will find yourself being behind extremely quickly. The problem is which are the right technology to invest in and which are the right technology to, uh, to really talk about. Can you stop the, start the clock, please, so we have a, a timing going on? Thank you. Um, Andrea yesterday spoke to you about technology and... Uh, and how much she's working on, and MIT is working on identifying real estate technology relevant. They actually have their own hype cycle for real estate, which I think is actually enlightening, okay? Um, <clears throat> it's also another scary part, you know, of our world. Um, and there's a lot of technology which are going to significantly transform the real estate industry and take it into new market. Uh, with the possibility of also to enter this new market with a whole array of uh, uh, digital solutions which are going to transform the way we look at 
managing a facility and operating it, managing finance, uh, input of data. It goes into quite a lot of direction. One thing is really disturbing, and she also mentioned about it, is 5G. And if you take, just take the rough history of the mobile phone and particularly how we came up to 5G, there's a lot to take in in terms of the transformation that one single piece of technology has put into our life and how it's going to start to impact you know, the real estate world. Now, I don't want to take you through the whole slide here because clearly you'll start uh, uh, on the year that I was born, 1973, okay, with the first uh, you know, cell phone. So 45 years ago, we saw a uh, mobile phone entering you know, our life. They've evolved you know, massively, but it's only, only in 2007 when the iPhone came you know, into our world that things starting to be shaken up you know, massively. And at this time, we didn't even have 2G or 3G technology. Uh, so let alone uh, what we have faced with today, which is 5G uh, a solution, you know, entering our, you know, our market. At the same time, we've seen, you know, at the bottom here of the slide, different ages appearing. The information age into the 70s and 80s, the social age with the GAFA uh, emerging uh, from 1998 onwards with Google uh, coming into our market. What I call the numerical age with the NATU and uh, the data you know, coming our way. Netflix, uh, Telsa, Airbnb, Uber was another revolution in terms of the way you know, we use uh, uh, technology of this kind. And the last one is the experience age and how you know, new market, new customers, and new players entered and starting to use technology very differently. Okay? So it's a wonderful uh, story wrapped around one single piece of technology, which is going to bring us some very significant changes. Here in red, 5G is going to be about gaming, face recognition, voice control, mind control, mobile payment, under display finger ca scanner, AI camera, pushed IoT, okay? So the, the story around technology can go very far. And that's just one out of the hype cycle um, for real estate. So a wonderful example about how this piece of technology is going to change us. And we know that we have in front of us with things like a mobile phone also, different type of users, different type, uh, different, uh, you know, workforce. Um, talking specifically about the workforce, there are some, again, very scary statistics, you know, coming our way. We will be missing 55 million workers, 55 million workers, or we need to increase productivity by 54% by 2030, okay? At the moment, the prediction, scientific prediction about natural increase of productivity are at 1.4%. If we do nothing, 1.4%. And, you know, so the gap that we have in front of us is actually quite significant. It's true that we are going to be, by 2025, half of us are going to be robots into the workplace. Uh, I think, again, Andrea and, and others have uh, insisted on this. We will be working side by side. We will share working hours uh, by 2025. We expect an increase, however, of 30%. <coughs> Uh, in average output per worker due to automation. So there is definitely something which is going to drive productivity and performance when we talk about uh, you know, technology. The next generation of robot is going to be cheaper. Okay, it's around you know, $4 per hour against 36 in the US to actually employ someone. So the challenge is actually really high if you look at all the different facets that technology is going to bring. And with that, of course, the whole issue around reskilling. 54% of employees will need to be reskilled by 2022. It's a minimum of one month's training to reskill someone in a workplace. One month. Okay? So, things are changing. The world around us is changing. The workforce is also, you know, changing at, uh, you know, at the same time. So, should we forget technology and just think about humans? Should we just concentrate on humans uh, and completely uh, uh, you know, embrace uh, technology at the same time? There's a lot of different ways you can actually answer that specific question and really tackle it. Um, but at the end of the day, a workplace looked like this. Okay? Human beings, 
socializing, coming together, using a physical environment. I really like this photo, which I actually found on the internet. Okay, this is not one which I have taken, but which I could potentially take uh, on a weekly basis into my working environment. And I'm sure you sh could also, you know, take that type of photos very easily. Okay, because that's what it is. It's a place where human beings comes together, and being human, it's probably one of the strongest trend which we have on our roadmap looking at the future. And I've been saying this for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And trust me, 10 years ago, talking about being human, you appear like a, a real idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was some doubt. But now it's really coming to reality and we're going to hear it a lot because what I see that you know, we, we really went through four different wave of, uh, wave of uh, digitization. The first one concentrated a lot on driving productivity. Okay, so technology was there to speed up uh, production process, to uh, decrease the amount of failures and default uh, which you have. Uh, and at the same time, we were concentrating on user experience. I think today we are into the phase where it is all about human experience, okay? Three years ago, our world, real estate, didn't want to talk about human experience, okay? I know that because three years ago, I published the first research on human experience, the same thing. People thought that I was completely gaga to talk about the word human in front of experience. And yet, today, it's something which is very common. We are right into this phase, and it's about the digital drive. It's about how we embrace that technology within real estate and make something out of it, whatever comes out of it. Could it be increase uh, collaboration, uh, um, increase the value of network? It, it goes into a lot of direction. I believe the future is going to be about human performance and that digitization is going to be there to enhance our life. So I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong, I strongly believe that I'm right on this. And again, you are going to uh, 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 challenge this, uh, maybe, or maybe even support it, okay? So I think that momentum, moving from user experience to human experience, where we write into today, looking at the future and starting to embrace human performance, for me, is the right path. And digital is going to be more transparent. I think we've heard something yesterday about technology being imperceptible. I call that shy technology. So it's actually there working in the background, but you don't see it. Okay? So we are moving from being passive users to being active users to being interactive users. At the same time, real estate is also changing. Okay? We've embraced mobility. We're now talking about agility, co-working. We had a lot of talks uh, yesterday and this morning about co-working, flex space, autonomous working, and finally coming to what I believe is an ecosystem of community spaces. Okay? <coughs> That's the vision that I have, and I strongly believe that um, we should not forget about technology, but we should pay more attention to humans. Okay? So let's ask the panel now cool. to give us your point of view. And I'd like to invite you, uh, you know, Kate, to start with, because you're going to mainly talk to us about workplace as a place. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say. So cool. thank you, Mary. Right. So um, I am going to seek your forgiveness that I'm going to use my notes, because my body clock's telling me it's about 4.30 in the morning right now. <laughs> So my, my ability to cognitive, uh, you know, have the cog cognition to remember everything might be a bit uh, awry. Um, we looked at some stats a minute ago, but uh, Marie didn't mention it, but it's on, uh, we, we talked about it as a group beforehand, that about 67% of the population, the global population now, carries a smart device. Mm. And uh, if you really think about that, what, what's that for? What do we use it for? We're using technology to make humans to make our human existence far more easy and far more convenient. We're using devices to remind us nowadays to breathe, to move, to stand. How much money have we taken out of the bank today? And in my case, has my iRobot actually started cleaning the lounge? 
Successful technology, successful technology applications are all about humans. In the scramble to digitize, much of big business has focused on technology, I believe, for technology's sake. And it has taken its eye off its very reason for being. I come from the financial services industry, and as you will all know, the financial services industry is going through significant change. For those of you that watch international news, particularly in Australia, where the big bad banks have just been through what we call a royal commission, which was an exercise where the banks had to go um, and be present towards a judge and actually stand up for their culture and for their behaviors. Society demanded in Australia that the banks actually revert to putting their customers first mm -hmm. and perhaps taking their eye off technology. I put it to you that the nature of today's big businesses, not only in Australia, are better, enab are better enabled by technology, but have swung in favor of actually the shareholder moving away from the customer and the inherently human service that they should be providing. In the case of my company, which is the Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, we're fortunate to have a CEO who early in 2016 foresaw the need to better manage the balance between both technology and societal needs. There's a lot of text here. This is the language that we use around our purpose. Our new CEO recrafted our purpose seeking to return our services to their original intent, for those of you that can remember, the friendly bank manager. We are, a, we are about shaping a world where communities and individuals thrive. At ANZ, we're striving to create a balanced, sustainable society in which everyone can take their part and build a better life. As you can see from the language highlighted here in our purpose, it's emotionally based. It's about harnessing technologies for the good of the people. It's about putting the people at the very center, the humans at the very center of everything we do. It's a really clear purpose that as human beings we can all relate to. And as a corporate real estate professional, I can really translate and manifest into physical environments. Mm -hmm. The ubiquitous nature of autonomous technologies, as we all know them, means that we can work where and when we like. We're on the brink of being able to holistically join meetings around the world. And yet, I hazard <coughs> most of us value actually turning up and being in the room face to face. People come to work to be with other people. There's a part of our, our, part of our industry, co-working, that has made, has capitalized on this aspect and made a whole career of it. Startups and contingent workers go to co-working spaces because they lack the individual scale to create communities themselves. And as human beings, we thrive in communities. At ANZ, we recognize the importance of community and the potential of highly agile ways of working. In 2018, we began a series of experiments where we started looking very specifically at human-centered design. We engaged with the business in a methodology that we coined Playbox. It relied on actually engaging with the people. We did use the blunt instruments, some of the data that we'd collected from understanding attendance profiles, and obviously we used tools, technology tools, to capture our information and collate it. But we sought really to understand the outcomes that the business was striving to achieve, and then we worked with our colleagues so that they could strip back their jobs to really understand the very human uh, nature, human-centered nature of the work they actually undertook. So you can see here that we created 14 ways of working. And these ways of working were around the physical activity that they undertook, and these 14 ways managed to pick up all the activities in the business direction we found across the bank. Not only that, but you can see from the top of the slide that we managed to cross-relate it with the engagement, that, with the engagement zones, which is how we design our branch network. So we felt very comfortable that these were 14 human-centered ways of working. These enabled us to create ergonomic kits of parts, highly mobile furniture and fittings that the end users can literally reconfigure around their own workplaces. They can change their workplaces now to match the project, their organizational structure, 
or the ever, ever increasing demands of our customers, we can move to, to address them very, very quickly with the physical environments we've created. So technology has played a part, but it wasn't overt. And I would hazard that the human engagement was far more engaging and enjoyable for our end users. We've recently applied these learnings to our, a new space that we've created. So about 200,000 square feet, so 20,000 square meters in my language. And we're testing with Playbox at scale. We've tested it to date in relatively small scale on a business by business basis. The new environment has very little built form. Most meeting spaces are open or mobile, and we've found that these 14 ways of working can be accommodated that way. The building capacity is now one in eight. That doesn't mean to say that we're max packing our people into tiny little desks. It actually means that we can accommodate um, much more collaborative, freestanding, larger groups in working uh, in new ways. We're seeking to allow our communities within the bank to shape their workplace. We're reviewing right now exactly what we need to measure in this new environment. We're seeking to understand what technology tools should we be using to support this whole new way of working and this new approach, new approach that our people are taking. We need to understand what those data sets will be and we need to really think carefully about what value they will bring considering we've enabled the freedoms that we have amongst our people. I'm sure you'll agree with me that if people are happy, they tend to be productive. We've extended the physical environment to mirror our individual technological expectations. On my device, I can customize my life the way I want it. Why shouldn't I be able to do that in my workplace? And this is what we have striven to do. My ability to do so in unison with a bunch of my colleagues means that I can actually become far more embedded and feel far more part of my organization. I have a sense of ownership, of belonging, and more than anything, a sense of purpose. When technology and the environment couple to provide customized, productive solutions, the real estate team, my team, have the opportunity to really think about the other elements that enrich the everyday human experience in our work world. These can be the fun, creative, far more quantitative, qualitative elements of our worlds that will help us not only attract but also retain the talent that everybody is seeking that we're all short of. Yes, you have to have the right end user tools, I don't deny. Yes, you have to have building management systems that you can rely on to give you the right kind of efficiency in your comfort and uh, your safety of your work environment. But do you need, I hazard, many more bits and bytes? <laughs> a human-centered workplace can become a differentiator in its own right. With work and life blending, the formality of work, as we all know, is changing. It's all about the humans. It's about providing workplaces that are fluidity, that are flexible, that encourage diversity, and that allow for the seamless integration of ecosystems and colleagues from other parts of partnering businesses. Today's enterprise needs to enrich the lives of the people it employs. Our physical environments, coupled with our intrinsically human emotions, create in us a sense of place and of belonging. Couple this with the ownership of ethical, with, a, with ownership and ethical purpose, and you have a business model in which, as humans, we can all relate and thrive. I there, so I therefore put to you that the real trick is to find the right level of technology to truly, truly support it. So I put to you three things that you need to adopt a holistic, cohesive, purpose-driven approach to your human performance, to achieve your human performance. You need to design first and foremost with a human-centric lens, which is really thinking about what am I trying to solve for here. And more than anything, you need to ensure that your technology tools are specifically selected to enhance your mission and not necessarily to work against it in its own right. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> Clearly, for a lady managing 1.4 million square meter across 31 uh, you know, countries, there's a lot to be told about uh, how you uh, develop all those new suite of environment at uh, ANZ uh, Banking Group. Um, so, on that point on technology, Peter, um, could you step in and tell us um, how technology is changing the world of real estate? You've been doing that since uh, 1996, a pioneer in the digitization of real estate and FM. 
and one of the founders of the Peter Drucker Forum, isn't it? So we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Marie. Okay. I would like to move on from Kerm to a very different vantage point, and I would hope that uh, you will follow me part of that way, in your <laughs> minds, possibly in your hearts. Another one. Um, conferences like this are quite often about trends. You need to put trends in titles. I, for one, am much more interested in principles. Because principles move us forwards and not trends. Let's see. Um, and uh, if I look at the principle of technology, when did it start? It started not with life on Earth, but it started with human life. Human life, or humanity, and technology are inseparable. Because humanity used technology to separate itself from nature. And by the way, uh, that's also when humans started to think about God. So uh, it's it together. God, certainly, for those who believe in that, is principle. It's all principle and no trend. Uh, if we look at the opposite of that, uh, and there I'm quoting my German countryman, Johann Wolfgang from Goethe, who lets his Mephisto say, uh, Ich bin die Kraft, die stets das Gute will und doch das Böse schafft. I am the power, which always wants good, nevertheless always creates evil. <laughs> who are the Mephistos of our times? Who make, who make these Faustian promises? Who give us these Faustian temptations. Is it Google? Is it, to a high degree, maybe Facebook? No. Um, one of the biggest disruptions in human development certainly was the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, for the first time, created the principle that reason should stand above belief. Again, applying this dichotomy of uh, principle versus trend. The principle for technology is to be based to support reason. The trend, as we all see it every day as we stare into our smartphones, is that technology supports belief. <laughs> that, but that's what makes problems for humans, yeah? not reason. Reason doesn't create problems. Um, technology is much more user-centered than ever before, but for the wrong purpose. To support belief and not to ground humans in reason, in principle. No. There is no user-friendly technology. Technology should never be our friend. It cannot be our friend. No. Uh, which is why I am saying, to put it to the maximum, bots. Yeah, are a crime in, it, in themselves. They, uh, or those who created them, perform the crime of impersonation, which makes us dumb, which makes us fearful, which makes us short-sighted, which makes us go against our best inner voices. Yeah? Only humans can be our friends. And of course, that entails also they can be our enemies. Yeah? So how do I? together with the colleagues from my firm, EFM, uh, contribute in minor ways to living humanely through, not for, not by, through technology. Just a few short thoughts. We create systems uh, that are based on the needs of individual people, literally so. I don't have the time, nor do I want to take it to prove that to you. But we start from, when it says here, demand management, from the individual's demand. And we go that over a daily cycle. We go through that over a daily cycle. We create human diaries for reflection and introspection, and not for control and supervision and monitoring. We do all that in real time, because people live in real time. Mm. I forge my existence not by daily uh, daily summaries, not by weekly reports, not by monthly or quarterly statements, but now in real time, if I'm a human. So I believe if tech really supports principles and humanity, it should also be in real time. Yeah? Um, and that means that 
reinforces factors like engagement, like performance, like relations, like the balance of your digital and actual human relations and interactions need to be seen by such systems in a holistic way to go from the performance of a Frederick Taylor, who, by the way, was convinced that he was doing the best for people, making them into automatons, to the human performance, which Marie uh, envisioned and sketched for us. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I mean, that's a great uh, you know, set. Yeah, you can applaud uh, him. <laughs> I thought you would get lost into the first section, but you actually managed to stick to the five minutes. Very good. <laughs> Jaren, um, edge, edge technologies. Uh, I mean, I love the way uh, uh, it's actually defined. You say that you aim to build a better, healthier, and more beautiful world by providing better buildings. So, and a lot of that is through the way you use uh, data and you digitize this working environment. So tell us, uh, you know, about it. Yes, thank you, Marie. <coughs> My name is Jeroen de Swart leading edge technologies in the USA. A quick introduction to our company. It started about 20 years ago when our founder, Koen van Oostrom, founded the company in Rotterdam. And right now we have offices in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, and uh, spreading out uh, across Europe. Berlin, Hamburg, and also an office in New York. We develop commercial office buildings, uh, and the edge building, I'll get back to that later in Amsterdam, is one of our developments uh, in 2014. We believe that the world needs better buildings. That's our mission. And that's because of two reasons. Uh, we believe we can do better with respect to sustainability. About 40% of CO2 emissions come from the built environment. And 85% 80, of the workers are not engaged. And we believe we need to do better. So our mission is, that's why we stand up every day, the world, need, the world needs better buildings. We try to do that in a holistic approach, integrating well-being, sustainability, design, and all powered and supported. I'll get back to that later by, by technology. Uh, what I want to show you, what we learned from the first generation of Edge Buildings, 2014, Edge Building in Amsterdam, developed for Deloitte, was then the smartest building in the world and still one of the smartest buildings in the world. And where we are now, we just opened a new Edge Building, Edge Olympic, also in Amsterdam. Between, in all those years, what we really learned is how you go from data to information to optimization. And that's the journey, that's the journey we're actually on. In the Edge Building in Amsterdam, we got a lot of data, but when, then we started the journey how to optimize it and use it in a way to come up with better buildings. Uh, now I'm going to focus on well-being and show a, a couple of examples how we do that to create a be better building and in the end a better, uh, a better workplace for people. Well-being, uh, well we believe uh, you need to integrate a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Strong design, communities, interactive spaces, human needs, inviting to walk around, atria, uh, staircases, but also, and it seems very simple, indoor conditions of your building. Um, for example, daylight. Uh, as a human being, we need about 100, 1,000 lux every day to maintain a healthy sleep uh, and wake rhythm. And normal office buildings these days give us only 500. So that's one of the challenges we try to solve in our designs. We always design for more daylight. Temperature. Our buildings, we give people uh, access and control over the temperature of the workplace between, between limits, for example. Noise, and I will get concentrate a little bit on air quality, which seems kind of obvious, simple, but to implement that with technology mm -hmm. is not that simple. <coughs> this is a picture of our first project in the US, the Unilever headquarters in Englewood Cliffs. We redeveloped 330,000 square feet, and we implemented 15,000 sensors in that building where you measure occupancy, uh, humidity, temperature, CO2 levels, noise levels. And with all that data, we try to optimize the building. Gives you also a little bit of a flavor of the design we like to, we like to implement, uh, encouraging people to meet and walk around. One of, the th one of the measurements we got out of all this data is CO2 levels in meeting rooms. And we were really surprised and kind of shocked how many meeting rooms actually reached CO2 levels above 1,500 ppm. And 1,500 ppm, your brain starts to function like you have been drinking a three and a half glasses of wine. So what we have been doing over time is try to optimize CO2 levels in, for example, meeting rooms, increase ventilation rates and measure it, and give tenants dashboards where they can real-time look at the CO2 levels, for example, and temperature in the meeting rooms and interv intervene in those. 
So in this way, we try to use technology to enable better buildings and enable a better workplace. Thank you. Mm. Really great. Thank you, Jaren. I mean, it's a great example about how, you know, digitization can actually help to understand how the fabric of a building functions, but also the impact on, uh, on human. But a building is also weaved within uh, an urban landscape, and we've asked you, Hala, to uh, come in and tell us a little bit more about uh, how this all fit within the context of a, of a city. Um, I really like the way uh, PLP is looking at the, you know, the future of architecture. You're saying that it's all about rethinking the responsibility of architecture as an actor in the environment. So show us how technology fits into all of this and how it's impacting human. Thank you, Maria. Um, so one thing that you talked about at the beginning of your presentation, uh, actually half at the end of your presentation, was creating... Uh, ecosystem uh, of, of users, ecosystems of community. And this is very much at the core uh, of our work. And this is precisely why we uh, started our lab, which looks at a new dimension of integration between people, technology, and places. Um, and in the last 10 years or 10 years old, uh, we've seeked throughout each one of our projects, the edge in Amsterdam being one of them, to understand how people interact and live and how this is evolving and how the built environment can respond to that. Um, I've chosen four examples here um, which have tried to do that. For example, the Francis Crick Institute, which is the, larger, uh, the largest cancer research center in Europe. Uh, tries to take actually the scientists out of their labs, um, <laughs> bringing them into that central space, but also bringing the public into a building that normally does not allow for that. Um, Sky Central, which is the headquarter of Sky TV uh, in the UK, is a very inward looking building mm. because of the nature of it. So we've introduced that internal street, which has a number of amenities from the city brought into the building itself. I won't talk about the edge again because you just did your own. And uh, 22 Bishopsgate is the tallest uh, tower in the city uh, in, in London and it will have a community of about 11,000 people. And we've brought these amenities up through the building and distributed them. Each one of these responds to a set of principles mm. um, so uh, whether it's health and well-being, sustainability, uh, placemaking, uh, and leisure. And what we see is precisely what you've talked about, the growing importance or the growing of the, well, of the well-being agenda. And we think it's because the correlation between well-being and uh, creativity and performance uh, is more and more established, and this agenda is therefore being pushed further ahead. And technology is, an, is a tool to help us activate these within, within the spaces. And uh, what remains the most important thing is stays the basics that we've been talking about um, since Roman times, which are the essential qualities of a space. But looking at these in more detail and with the data that we're able to look at now, three questions uh, emerge, and I'll try through my next slides to address them. Um, so the first one is, uh, what do we do when human comfort, which we're really trying to design for, is not compatible with what's good for the planet? How do we mitigate that? How do we change our habits? Um, in, in a context where uh, legislation takes time to change and evolve, how do we conceive better partnerships with the public sector precisely to be able to drive that in a, the right direction in a responsible way? And the last one with us being able to understand what is bringing values, value to our cities, what people like, what people respond to, how do we then put uh, investment towards that? And we, if it means changing uh, the way we think about investments generally. So um, the first one is thinking in constellation uh, or an ecosystem rather than in isolation. I'll give one example. In London, we don't have zoning like you do here, but we have land use categories which were established a very long time ago and maybe revisited once, I think, about 50 years ago, which means that we're not allowed to, we can't overlap uses on, in the same space. And, um, 
and we, we can do it, but not in a very nimble way. And we, ha we are missing land uses. It's only recently, after uh, working with the collective who presented this morning uh, on the first co-living building in London, that a co-living um, co category or discussion is introduced in the London plan. So how, how, how uh, the, the issue with this, the essential issue with this is that we are not being able to use the space in the most efficient way. We're therefore replicating space and building more, which is not necessarily very good for the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, most, the best use of land. The second thing is early meaningful engagement. <coughs> Having conducted a number of consultations, uh, of community consultation, which happen in the context of planning in London, they happen from three to five on a Tuesday afternoon. So we end up having, not having necessarily the active members of the community. Young professionals often don't attend these. We end up with a lot of lovely old ladies, but that is not representative of uh, of the community. Uh, there's a really young, interesting uh, startup led by a lady called Savannah de Savary, looking, working with local authorities in London and a number of developers on creating tools to, to enable more members to be able to participate in these. The next point is neurodiversity. We, we talk about big, um, bright places being the, the, the best thing for creativity, but we're seeing that different people actually behave differently in different places. And uh, sometimes a smaller, more intimate place with a bit of a dim light has a better impact. Mm -hmm. The same story with open plan. We've been going on and on about open plan and now we're like, that wasn't a, such a great thing after all. So how can we design spaces that reflect that neurodiversity? Uh, and there is also a lot of interesting work being developed by uh, the Centric Lab in London and a researcher, Araceli Camargo, if you're interested. This one goes back to what you were talking about um, earlier uh, in the context of um, jobs getting, uh, you know, um, AI taking over most of the automated jobs. How can we design spaces that are not there to boost uh, productivity, but rather to spark creativity? And last but not least is culture. And by culture, I mean cultural infrastructure. So not only a, a museum or uh, a place of consumption, but place of production. It can be an artist studio. It can be um, a rehearsal space uh, and so on. These are things, these are places that make, that make us want to be um, in certain cities and occupy them in certain way and appropriate them. So make them successful. We are now being able to measure the impact uh, of culture on uh, regeneration and development. We're working with the mayor of London on uh, articulating how this is measured and embedding it in development by helping the different actors around the table to communicate better and understand uh, how they can best engage through the different stages. I can see you waving behind yes. me. Yes. So I will yeah. finish <laughs> these questions and uh, happy to discuss it with you uh, and go into some of the points in more detail if helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. So we've heard a lot. Uh, we started with, uh, you know, workplaces. Uh, creating ecosystem of uh, communities for humans to network, and you've demonstrated that. Peter, clearly technology is the enabler and its role is uh, evolving to empower people to uh, uh, express uh, you know, themselves. I think that link between people and technology is really important. The edge, I mean, data is a brain of real estate. Uh, we heard this morning about data being the new oil, and I think that's uh, what the edge is, has been doing. But digital is also the, the blood and the nervous system uh, uh, through uh, building in cities and probably soon through humans uh, with the evolution of, uh, of technology. Uh, and it's all weaved into the urban uh, you know, fabric. Uh, places uh, are clearly a destination, and I think you've uh, shared with us, uh, uh, shared with us some uh, fantastic projects. I mean, Sky, uh, The Edge, and uh, uh, and your latest building are really great uh, thing. But culture is clearly the glue, uh, as you say, and the soul. Uh, uh, at the same time, so we heard a lot. So yes, human are important. So I want question from the audience. Is there anything which inspired you about what has been said? Uh, would you like to hear more? Tell us. Okay. I'm just curious, what of the data that you've seen from the edge has been compelling enough to more people adopting that? Because I think some people might not think it's so bad to feel, to be in the pocket of their own. 
Can we just get you to say that a little louder? So it <laughs> yeah. Data from the edge. I'm just curious, what are the most compelling data points to get people to buy into this, that, that well-being and health in the workplace is really a critical element that needs to be considered today? Uh, it's a combination of temperature, for example. I mentioned two CO2 levels, occupancy, what are, what are the really crowded areas? So you can redesign your floor plans a little bit. But how do you, how do you instill that urgency in, into people to say, we need to adopt that technology for our own business? What we experience is that we're in buildings where we implement the technology, people really are willing to use it. Okay. And we heard a lot this morning about you know, the value of the quality of data, and I guess you're probably spending a lot of time cleaning this data and making sure it's, uh, it's at the right level. Okay. Um, Hala, I want to know what you think about, uh, we are running a program of community in South America and Uruguay, and I'm very um, worried about pri privacy of the people Mm -hmm. and how, how it's going to fight the people, the millennials, against privacy. They are making new profiles of them in Facebook and Google just to don't let information to those firms. So at the same time, we are managing with uh, programs as community. Mm -hmm. We are taking information of the people, and the people don't want to show their own information. So how okay. it's going to fight the future with this? Yeah, privacy. Privacy. I think a good example is what you're doing in the edge because all the data that is taken is actually um, anonymous, but it's still be, we are still being able to process it. And to go back to your question, to measure that absenteeism has completely dropped and, and, and to get all of this data. But this is more in relation <coughs> to the workplace. You're talking about collecting data maybe for a political reason, which is maybe also a bit of a different topic. Um, and um, I think it makes me nervous. I think you need uh, to, to educate people as to what data they make available, because in reality, you can control what you're giving away and what you're not giving away. Mm -hmm. Luckily, in Europe, we are protected. Yes. Uh, but I I'm, I'm don't really know the situation in Latin America. In the Middle East, it is a problem mm -hmm. uh, as well. And I'm sorry, yeah, it is, Peter, but maybe you want to say uh, if I, something. If I may add to that, um, if you generate data and make it available, first of all and foremost to the humans who are concerned by it, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, data becomes more fleeting and the need to record it yeah, for posterity forever mm. becomes less demanding. You either react in real time or it's gone. Mm. So I know that's a very fundamental, differently approach, but uh, it is. And on the other hand, let's not be mistaken. The moment you make human behavior into data, you are giving away uh, a basic level of privacy that can never be recovered. Yeah. From that, it is only protective mechanisms and not uh, any kind of promises that will help you uh, from misuse or that will shield you from misuse. How are you treating privacy uh, use of data actually in, in at INZ uh, Banking Group? So from, uh, for us, the the flexibility that we've given people means that we we are far less concerned about the, the mm -hmm. basic data, and that's our challenge: is how to what technologies do we use to really help us operate and create better environments for them? Mm -hmm. We have given them human freedoms, um, and that kind of is therefore coupled by data freedom. Um, so it's 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 as I say, we're wrestling with what kind of technologies do we actually need to introduce that are necessary to support that very human, yes. human approach. Mm. Yeah. yeah. OK, uh, another question in the audience about uh, what you heard. And uh, so should we forget about technology? And I mean, forget in terms of like, don't pay attention to it. And it is there working in the background. You all agree with that? Or yeah? No? Tell, tell me why. If you don't mind. Thank you. I think for the same reason that privacy and um, public good mm -hmm. have to be weighed and balanced, 
we all have to be cognizant of the fact that we all, I'm sure everyone here has a smartphone on them, uh, we all are being tracked. And so I think you can't forget about it. You have to think yeah. about it. Digital privacy or health information, all, all of that is, is part of our world. It's part of our children and our grandchildren's world. And so, no, I don't think so. But I, mm -hmm. I think we have to be ethical about yeah. it. And I think ethics, we didn't talk about this in this panel today, um, but the displacement of workers, and when you think about that, the person who has maybe a high school education or not yeah. even that, what kind of job will that person be able to do in the new world 20, 30 years from now when all of these truck driver jobs and other jobs aren't there for them? I think we all have a responsibility. I, I, I see either evolution or revolution. And if we don't manage it well, and I mean everybody in this room, if we don't manage it well, it will be, I sound like a political statement here. I don't mean it to be that way, but I think inequality will only grow and disenfranchisement will only burgeon. And I think, uh, I think it's upon all of us to, to think about that and okay. make sure that the benefits that we all enjoy because we are educated and live in great countries, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that other people who don't have the same advantages can take advantage. And technology mm -hmm. will help with that. So no, I don't think you can separate the two. So um, how, long, how long should we take, should we give to our industry to actually come to a, a level, a model, whereby we are in control of all the data and the technology that we put into our facilities. And as you say, the ideal scenario would be like ethically you know, compliant and you as a user can choose what you give or don't give uh, and what you take and, uh, and, and, and put aside. I mean, are we talking about a five year time frames or beyond five years? So we for in less than five years will be in full control. Okay, cool. <laughs> More than five years to be in full control of our data? Yeah, panel? More than five years, yeah? I would like the European Parliament together, we, uh, right after it's newly elected, together with United States Congress to get on this immediately. Mm -hmm. This is a cross-continental issue. This is not a national issue. Global, who knows? Cross, let's, if these two uh, entities start working on it now, now and not in five years, we may see some progress within five years, yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, look, it's a break. Thank you very much. So let's not forget about technology. It is there. It's there to stay for a very long time. We do need to take control of, of course, data, whatever way this is done, uh, uh, either uh, through regulation or through you know, self-control uh, self and, uh, and uh, uh, ethics. Uh, but it is all about the human. And I think we got a demonstration today that at a micro level within workplace, uh, through you know, the way you look also at cities and, uh, and places as a destination, uh, it's uh, equally important. Human should be your first uh, priority. And being human is definitely how they as one of the most uh, and strongest trend, uh, Peter, that we have on our roadmap. So thank you very much, and be happy to interact with you uh, during the break. But thank you for... Uh, <laughs>